have a lot of applause to give these ladies right now because so many good things have happened. We have a Golden Globe nominee on the end there. A BAFTA Rising Star nominee as well. And then on top of that, you know what Booksmart got this morning? A WGA nomination. It did. Congratulations. So well deserved. Thank Given you. the script nomination, I did want to start at the beginning because a long while back, this script actually made the blacklist. Yes. And it went through a couple of wonderful female writers and then wound up in your hands and Katie Silverman's hands. So can you tell us a little bit about that journey and what changed along the way? I would love to. First of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you for showing up. This is so exciting and we are very, very excited to see you. Um, it's on Hulu, but it's cool that you came here. I, I feel bad. No, it was a, a long journey for this movie, like a lot of great movies, I feel. Um, sometimes they take a while to kind of find their home. And in 2009, two great writers, uh, Sarah Haskins and Emily Halpern, who are a writing duo, wrote the original version of Booksmart. And it was about two best friends who were women who truly, deeply loved each other. And that resonated with people enough that it was on the blacklist, it got a lot of people's attention, but it didn't ultimately make its way to production like so many good scripts. And then in 2014, it was then in the hands of Annapurna. And then Susanna Fogel came on to do a pass. And it moved further in the direction uh, of where it ended up and evolved and uh, that was the draft I originally read. And I was so excited that someone wanted to make a movie about two women who loved each other completely and they were not trying to assimilate to be cool or to find boyfriends or any of the bullshit that we've all been fed our entire lives by these movies. And uh, yeah, I was really happy about that. And I was like, ah, oh, please please let me direct this movie, and I pitched my heart out, and when I got the gig, I said, I re my dream is to now update this, because now it's 2016, and I'm like, we need to match this story with the world today, and this young generation today, uh, who are growing up in this insane time. I asked if I could bring on a writer, and, and of course they said yes, and that's when I met Katie Silberman. Katie's here. Let's give Katie's her here. a that bigger round Katie. of applause. Katie Silverman in the house. I was building up to my huge reveal. <laughs> She's here amongst us tonight. And I'll never forget that in our first conversation when I said, what would you do to take this story to the next level? I really want to bring in the theme of judgment into this story. And she just said, what if all the other kids were smart? And I was like, Whoa. That's it. I was like, can you start today? And she did. And it was just <laughs> thrilling. That's it. So that was how it all began. I'm so glad that journey panned out and this is what we wound up with because it's something else. And so are you two in the movie. I'm curious, did you know each other before you were cast in this? No. <laughs> The chemistry is absolutely pitch perfect in this. So when you find out the other is cast, what's the first thing you do? Do you call each other up and want to hang out? Well, uh, we decide to move in together is what we do. Um, and it's what we did. We met at a, at a lunch, our very first lunch, sitting down with the three of us and talking about the movie and where we were going to shoot it and live you know, came up with this idea. She said, oh, that'd be great if you guys could live together. And we kind of just looked at each other and went, can we please? Um, holding hands. Holding hands. Met 20 minutes prior to that. Um, and then it was just love at first sight and we were just inseparable. Did you invite the rest of the ensemble over for like mini house parties or something? No time. These girls. We worked. were. Yeah. We shot the movie in 26 days. They worked so hard. I don't think there was any time for said house parties. We were. Yeah. We were going to work at like 6 p.m. and coming home at 6 a.m. And that's not. That's not really a Caitlin Deaver schedule, but it's really not a Beanie Feldstein schedule. <laughs> 
I'm in bed at 9 p.m. usually, so <laughs> it was a trip starting scenes at 4 a.m. Um, but no, we never had met. I was such an admirer, and I continue to be, of Caitlin's work. I think she is the most extraordinary actor under the sun. Um, and so when I, I, she'd been attached for a long time, and when I met with Olivia about it, I just was like, is she still attached? Please tell me it's still her. And she was like, it's still her. And I was over the moon um, to learn from her and to collaborate with her. But us living together was really like deeply an integral to I think what you see on screen because it just created this trust between us and this language of love between us. And I, it was the best time also, <laughs> just separately from that. A lot of snuggling, a lot Lots of, of snuggling, yeah. It was the best. We were running our lines all of the time. It was it was the greatest thing ever because you don't really ever get that opportunity on anything else. You're usually just tossed onto set and you're supposed to do a scene with this person who's supposed to be your best friend of 10 years. And it was so amazing. It's, it's kind of like a, it is definitely a once in a lifetime situation. It was amazing. You could feel that history between the two of you. It radiates off screen when you watch the movie, and so does the history between your characters and the rest of the ensemble here, and I, you guys know how much I adore the ensemble in this movie. Beanie, I did want to ask you, though, because if you're not following Beanie on social media, you should, because you have a very close-knit group of friends, and it's the sweetest thing, because you're all just huge right now, and you're supporting each other every single step of the way. So did you have anything to do with getting some of your friends in this movie? Well, <laughs> no, actually, because Olivia and Molly Gordon, who plays AAA, who's my best friend, um, worked together in Love the Coopers. And so that's how Olivia knew of Molly. But when she said she was bringing her in, I was like, that's cool. Um, hope she does great. Uh, no pressure, you know, I just, <laughs> and then you said it was her and I was over the moon. And we play enemies in the movie, which is, I think, really brilliant of Olivia to go against that dynamic that we have. Um, but Molly's work in the movie, that scene in the car, I think, is so grounding and hilarious and important for women. And her performance is so dynamic, um, and Noah Galvin. It just was surreal, the whole experience working together, yeah. We had the best casting director in the business, Allison Jones, who's a, a superhero and has defined what we all think of as a funny person for several generations now. And when I said to her, I just want to cast real people. I want it to be fresh. I want them to be authentic and funny in, in their bones. And we met so many fantastic young actors because she casts a wide net and she worked seven days a week. Um, I'll never forget her calling me on a Sunday morning at 8.30 saying, you got to get over here. You got to see this kid. He's amazing. And I was like, what are you doing working on a Sunday morning? And she's like, kids, they go to school, so you have to meet them on weekends. And I was like, of course. <laughs> and I went over there and it was Austin Crute who plays Alan. And he's so fantastic. And by the end of this audition, it was now like 9.30 a.m. on a Sunday. And I was like, you have the role. And he was going back to NYU. And I was like, you have to stay and make this work. And that was how the casting process went. It was very organic. And I was so lucky to have this ensemble. So lucky because they're all going to be massive stars. And they're good people. So that's great. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. What was the most difficult role to cast? Well, I mean... Honestly, they were, it, was, it was equally sort of challenging because I wanted each character to kind of upend the trope that is apparent in so many high school comedies. You know, I didn't want it to be uh, basic in a boring way. I just was like, let's find people who, for each role, no matter how small, I wanted them to bring their essence and to bring interesting choices. So I think with casting, everything is equally challenging and fantastic. It's an opportunity to unlock so much. And when I came on, Caitlin was attached, which was a huge reason I wanted to make the movie because I too was a huge fan ever since Short Term Shocking. 12. Shocking. Unbelievable. Don't talk about I Short Term 12 without warning. Oh, watch Short Term 12. Let's watch Short Term 12. I, I love it so much. I'd and be fine with that double feature. I, to cast Molly up against Caitlin's Amy, I had the opportunity to cast someone as brilliant and as exciting and 
my first pitch included a huge picture of Beanie. And it was so funny because she had never met me. She didn't know that I was stalking her for a good year. That's the great thing about the internet, is it really allows you to stalk someone consistently. Um, and so that worked. It turns out stalking can work out. All right. I guess there is Stick a bright to side it. to that every once in a while. Caitlin, this is your first lead role in a comedy? Yeah. Yeah. What was that like? What was it about the genre that might have surprised you? And I don't know, how do you how do you figure out that sweet spot with your own comedic tone and style? I don't know. I was sort of just like rolling with I mean, this is actually my first lead in anything ever. It's me and Beanie's first lead mm -hmm. ever. Which is so cool to be able to share that with someone, someone that you love so much. And the, the amazing thing about doing this movie is that we both shared equal passion for these girls and their love for each other. And yeah, I th it, was, it was really, really scary and, and, and daunting to think about it and prep. And you tend to like overthink everything when you're like looking at every page and you're like, Oh boy, we're we talk all the time. Still talking. <laughs> Still talking. Um, and I've never experienced that. I've never had to take that on. But I had, you know, so much love for um, Amy and and her compassion and her kindness. And I don't know. It was. It, I think the weight and the pressure was taken off immediately when Beanie and I were to able to look at each other and hold each other's hands and go, okay, well, if you fall, I'll catch you. And it was the best experience. It was really the best possible experience. It's always sounded every time we've spoken, like it's got one of the best vibes and atmospheres on set. And it makes me think with your history acting, is there anything you've experienced on a set that made you think, when I direct my own movie, I'm gonna do this this way because that's, that's what felt right and true to me. Yeah, uh, music. Honestly, music is obviously a huge part of the movie and it's a huge part of the movie making experience. I really believe in music and snacks and that's all you need, that's it. Um, but truly making this, I was able to draw from every great experience I've had on set and every terrible experience I've had. I mean, we all know your worst experience at work has been the most valuable because it teaches you what to avoid and those cautionary tales are so uh, essential. So I have had experiences on set where I felt inspired and supported and I wanted to draw from those and to avoid all the terrible shitty experiences I've had with people who don't understand the kind of crazy delicate hypnotic work that actors are doing. It, it's it's not easy what they do. And I wanted to just create an environment conducive to their best work. And, but mostly it was music and snacks. <laughs> well, now we have to ask, what was the soundtrack of Booksmart while you were shooting? And then what was the snack of choice? It was a lot of hip hop. Um, I think, I mean, a lot of what you hear in the eventual soundtrack was playing. We had a lot of Lizzo on set and that was exciting. She was, it was like an early, early deep cut Lizzo uh, retrospective of every day. <laughs> and then we had a lot of Kendrick Lamar. Um, it, was, it was about creating energy that kept everyone feeling that kind of badass swagger that I wanted this movie to have because that's what I believe these smart female characters have. There's nothing apologetic about these characters. Like, as we said, they're not trying to assimilate. They're not apologizing for being smart. They're not apologizing for not being, a, for not being popular. They really feel good. They love each other and they love their lives. And yet, they're open to this discovery that everyone else doesn't suck. But I just wanted to keep that kind of like grounded, badass swagger. And it really, it, it does affect the room. I, I remember, I'm so grateful for that. Because I remember there was this one moment, it was extremely helpful. We were walk. it was this scene when we were walking into the party for the very first time, Nick's, Nick's house. And you were playing, we were blasting Red Mercedes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we had started this scene that way, but when would we, we, when you turn on that song, it was like, oh, we really, really feel this, and you really feel the energy. 
And that you, 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 you don't really get that on any other kind of set, and that's all things to live. Backing up to the moment that happens right before that, I'm curious, did you let them improvise a little? Because especially that scene where you guys are complimenting each other, I don't know, I just see that going on and on and on and getting more and more creative the more you do it. Yeah, they're wonderful. I mean, they're like great athletes. You just throw them something and they take it and they catch it. I'm not good at sports, so this is where my, <laughs> my metaphors collapse but they just were so aware of their characters on like deep chemical level that like anything new we threw at you whether it was a few alts to play with or an entirely rewritten scene that Katie and I had rewritten over lunch and we said hi guys we rewrote everything and now you have to perform it um they just didn't miss a beat it was pretty astonishing is there a particular scene you're referencing where you had to adjust on the fly yeah, the scene outside the theater party when they're sitting in the grass, that was a scene where we just had this epiphany while we were watching rehearsal that there was something missing from it. And we sat in the kitchen and we all just kind of shared a lot of intimate life experiences, talked a lot very quickly about friendship, and then realized what that scene should be. And then they brought it to another level. I remember that kitchen moment. You and Katie were sharing a salmon. We were. <laughs> <laughs> so true. And she actually slapped me, fun yeah. fact. Yeah. I was like, you're going to have to slap her. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just once. I always wonder about those things. You got to do what you got to do. do yeah. Yeah. Take one for the team. Totally. There's a sports yeah. analogy for you. And uh, the jail scene as well. And the jail scene. Right. It was like we created it on the day, I felt Yeah, like, but it was great. It was, it was like at that point... You knew the characters so well that it was so easy to kind of work within the confines of that definition. It was like, what if, knowing these two people, they took it this way or that way? You can't do that with people who've only done superficial amount of work on their characters. It has to be deeply rooted to be able to actually take detours and experiment. I think the greatest thing I learned from you was if you prepare so much before you can be so free on the day. And that was something I feel like we had so had together. It was like, we came in hyper prepared. We approached this like Molly and Amy. We were like, checklist, gotta get through our it's homework, gotta get it done. Um, but then on the day we could just let go and be so open to everything you had to say and each other and Katie's beautiful alts. And that was so liberating, I felt like. Can you guys tell us a little bit about shooting the fight scene? Because it doesn't matter how many times I've seen this movie, I watch that and I am emotionally exhausted after that. So is that a similar experience that you have after going through a scene like that? Yes. Well, you have a funny story about this, but <laughs> we, we didn't, we decided that we had run everything together. Every single scene we went over together, over and over. And Liv, I think this was, yeah, this was definitely Liv's suggestion that we don't run this scene at all, the fight scene. So we kind of, and we were kind of quiet all day. We didn't really talk, which was really weird. Um, we had different call times too, so we didn't yeah. see each other in the morning in our apartment. <laughs> and I was, Caitlin called, was called first and I didn't have anyone to run lines with. So I called my mom and... She's from Long Island, and she's very loud, and has minimal reading comprehension. <laughs> and her and I ran the scene, and to this day, it is one of the funniest moments of my life. She was like, you being a bad friend! And I was like, ay, ay, ay. <laughs> I don't know how this is gonna go down. Um, but her screaming my favorite at me, story she's of like, all time. I'm not going to Botswana now, I'm going in a year! It's like, what are you talking about? Reflections are off. <laughs> no reading comprehension. Every question is a statement. Every statement is a question. Um, but I appreciate her nonetheless. We love Shay. We love Shay. But um, when we got together, it was so um, raw. That's the word I would use. And Olivia was like, I want to do this in one shot. If we need to, we can go in and cover it. But I want this one shot. And it was so bold and it was so... She set the standard, and then we together looked at each other and rose to it. And I think it was the scariest scene I think I've ever filmed in my whole life, just because we both were in such different places for the first time. We usually were so together, and for once, 
we were so separate and that was so fun and scary to live in. The worst thing in the world is, is to get in a fight with your best friend. It's like, it, it, it hits you in your gut. And I felt all, I mean, we felt all of those emotions and I was definitely crying. It definitely really, really wrecked us. Um, it was a tough scene. It, it was, was a tough scene. I mean, it was insane because they uh, had, they, that was, what you see is the second take which is crazy because it's a seven minute shot that goes from the pool all the way through the house, through the fight. It's insane. <laughs> and everybody had to work together to make that happen. There were so many extraordinary background actors who had to be completely on the same page as us in terms of timing and moving behind cameramen and everybody working together. Our operator, Chris Harhoff, who was able to capture that fight with the Steadicam and capture the listening as much as the speaking and the performers being able to nail it in that way. I mean, it was my dream to make that shot happen but if they hadn't been so prepared, it just would never have been possible. Nails it across the board. So I'm gonna ask one more question, but then we have something special planned for you guys in the audience, but I'm not gonna ruin my trend here because I do love this question, and you guys have been name dropping wonderful people in your ensemble and on your crew. If you were to name a book smart, unsung hero, a name that we need to know because they gave you a boost on a tough day or just worked extra hard, who would you pick and why? Many people, so many people. Oh my God! Feel free. I, name we can more each we can one. each do a different one. I'm I'm gonna call out Scott Robertson, our AD, who is an extraordinary person, and uh, he has AD'd for like massive directors like Inuritu. Like he did The Revenant, which was great because anytime <laughs> things were stressful on Booksmart, I'd be like, but it's not The Revenant, <laughs> right? And he'd be like, okay, You're fine. Warm. <laughs> But he is the reason this movie got made. He's the one who didn't tell me my ideas were crazy. He didn't laugh me out of the room when I said, I wanna do this underwater sequence, I wanna do this stop motion animation sequence, which took five months and 30 animators for two minutes of film. He didn't tell me that I was crazy to want that dance fantasy, which involved Beanie and Mason rehearsing on the weekends with the choreography, Dina Thompson, another unsung hero. There were. So many things that Scott could have told me to just forget. And he could have been patronizing, and he could have said, you're clearly a first timer, you want all that nonsense. And instead, he created a, a scenario in which I could, I could fulfill my dreams. So for me, it's Scott. I know my, our production designer, Katie Byron, she is a dreamboat of a person. Her, I think just having her on set, there was automatically a different energy. So she's such a good, good, good soul. But <clears throat> she also understood Molly and Amy to, to, to a core. I mean, she, to, she really, really wanted us to feel extremely comfortable. I remember one of our, like one of our first emails to me, she asked me like, I mean, we were just discussing like Amy's car and what kind of stickers I wanted on the back of her car. And, and she asked me what I wanted in Amy's trunk. I mean, it was so detailed and my bedroom, it, it, everything was so spot on. And I think she, she's, just, she's just brilliant. We love her. It's so rare to have a female stunt coordinator, but let alone one that is a grandmother. Um, our stunt coordinator told me that she had her eighth grandchild the day that she, one of the days she came into work. And I was like, imagine being on the playground and you're like, what does your grandma do? Mine's in assisted living. And the other kid being like, mine is a stunt coordinator and is peeling Jared's car out onto the road and turning it around. I just thought that was incredible. I mean, we had so many incredible women on our crew, but she was like, the most badass woman I had ever met in my life. That was beautiful. I want to just call out, this is so fun, we, we won't do this for hours, though we could. We definitely um, could. But also Jason McCormick, our cinematographer, just because he was very excited that you guys would be seeing this movie in the Dome tonight. This is, ex you know, this is a dream for me. I never thought the movie would be bigger than like a postage stamp, maybe an Instagram square. 
And the fact that it's been on movie screens has been extraordinary, but to have it here is truly mind-blowing. And I know Jason shares that with me as a cinematographer. He's responsible for this beautiful movie. So, Jason. Job very well done all around. All right, we promised you guys something fun. So what we've got is five posters to give away, all signed by these three wonderful women right here. What we're gonna do is a little book smart trivia. So I'm gonna read a question. You have to raise your hand, don't shout it out. And we've got some Arclight staff members who are gonna help picking one person. So don't shout them out. All right. First one here is a true or false question. Caitlin and Beanie, oh well, Caitlin and Beanie lived together to prepare for the movie. Oh. <laughs> is there another one? We got one right here. True. You were paying attention to the Q&A. You, you yes, deserve a poster. A poster. <laughs> <laughs> they will bring the posters around to you. All right. Oh, yeah. Next question here. What code word is used by Amy and Molly several times during the film? <laughs> yeah. That is correct. <laughs> Malala. All right, next up here is what college does Molly plan on going to after high school? You guys know the movie so well. <laughs> Someone back there, I, I believe. Woohoo! Yale. Yale? We got it. All right, that's, that's three down. We got two more to go here. During her gap year, Amy plans to travel to what country? Yep, Botswana is correct. And now we have to go up there. For yeah, the next do we want to pull one from the, the top? Oh, I think we have to. I'm giving it to the top section here. Ready? At the end of the film, what food does Amy suggest her and Molly get before her flight? The ushers wield such power. Yeah, pancakes! Pancakes! <laughs> pancakes. <laughs> One more reminder, please stay seated, guys. Congratulations to everyone who won a poster. Let's Thank please give the so team behind much. Booksmart a big round of applause right now. Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Collider FYC, Arclight, have a wonderful evening.